I think uh, we will begin. I hope that I'm correct in thinking that we're now on chapter, what does that mean? Nine? One X, settling disputes. I think there might have been like a tiny paragraph in the last chapter that we didn't finish, but that can be your homework if there was. <laughs> and if you haven't read it by now, then I guess you won't miss it. So, so this one is settling disputes. The last one was uh, actually about disputes and people love those chapters. It's really interesting. They tend to love the chapters on anger and disputes and conflict because this is really the problem in our lives, isn't it? You know, if we could live at peace, then there wouldn't be any problem. But unfortunately, we create a lot of problems and conflicts, often through uh, viewing others as different from ourselves, you know, viewing others as wrong and ourselves as right, of course. Um, <laughs> and sometimes we might be wrong, and the Buddha tells us what to do about that too. So without any further ado, shall we start? Are you ready? Yeah. So for those who are here for the first time, we follow this little book called Social and Communal Harmony. But if you don't have it in your hand, don't worry. I'll only read out a little bit at a time. And um, you can raise your hand at any point and ask questions. I'll also perhaps have the um, lucidity <laughs> in my days to um, say a few words as well. So it's page 147 for those with the book. And this uh, little paragraph is from the Samyutta Nikaya, number 11, 24, and it's called Confession and Forgiveness. Now here, I'll just say, as a um, caveat that usually talks about monks. <laughs> so wherever it talks about monks, I'll say monastics. And wherever it, uh, if, it's, if it relates to lay people too, I'll just say community. This one is probably more of the monastic uh, way of settling disputes. So once two monastics had a quarrel, would you believe it? <laughs> and one monastic had transgressed against the other. Then the former monastic confessed their transgression to the other, but the latter would not pardon him or her. Then a number of monastics approached the Blessed One and reported what had happened. The Blessed One is the Buddha. The Blessed One said, Monastics, there are two kinds of fools, one who does not see a transgression as a transgression, and one who, when another is confessing a transgression, does not pardon them. These are the two kinds of fools. There are two kinds of wise people, one who sees a transgression as a transgression and one who, when another is confessing a transgression, pardons them. These are the two kinds of wise people. So it's very nice because obviously here, someone has done the right thing by confessing and the other one didn't pardon him. But instead of the Buddha saying, Oh, you know, you stupid person, you fool, you didn't pardon the other monk. He just teaches the Dhamma in an impersonal way. He just points out the proper way to act. And, you know, one is a fool when one does not act a certain way. So it's not a fixed thing. It's not that somebody's either foolish or wise. It's something that's determined by our actions, by our behavior. And the Buddha always teaches the Dhamma rather than teaches... Um, to reprove an individual. It's a, more of a, of a law or of a, a kind of law of nature, if you like. And I think it's very beautiful, isn't it, that you know he's asking us to pardon those who ask for forgiveness because they have actually seen their mistake. They are fallible human beings like ourselves. And the Buddha always says that seeing one's mistakes and being able to acknowledge them is actually progress in the Dhamma. And it's really important as a monastic to understand that because we do make mistakes. And sometimes, you know, there's 311 training rules for bikinis, 227 for monks, uh, fully ordained monks and nuns. And you're bound to transgress some of these from time to time, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. And the beauty of the training is that you have a system 
whereby you can acknowledge it and seek forgiveness. Um, most of the time, a good teacher doesn't even feel it's their kind of role to necessarily forgive. It's just enough that the person knows for themselves because we're adults and it's about bringing mindfulness to our, our actions and, and just being able to see when we've transgressed. Nobody goes up and says, which rules have you transgressed? Have you done this? Have you done that? How have you done the other? You're expected to know for yourself. And this increases our mindfulness, our circumspection, um, the ways we treat one another, the respect that we show. And um, on the part of the other, it's, uh, you know, if we have actually hurt somebody and we and we apologize to them, it's uh, it's very commendable if we can forgive. It's very desirable because otherwise, of course, we're only harming ourselves. And of course, many people find it difficult to forgive and forgiveness is a process. It's not something that happens overnight. But I think it's lovely to um, understand that, you know, it is foolish to hold on to grudges, to hold on to resentments, because ultimately we only harm ourselves. So by actually... Uh, Acknowledging a transgression, seeing a transgression as a transgression, again, showing wisdom, showing discernment, we know what's right or wrong, harmful or unharmful. Yeah. Then you're already wise. And I was thinking earlier when I just glanced through this paragraph that it's similar to meditation. Some people think that in meditation we have to have a certain experience, you know, we shouldn't feel anger or we shouldn't feel restlessness when we sit down, but actually the real progress is understanding that right now there's restlessness. You know, at least you know what you have to work with and there's no need to condemn it. Perhaps we can forgive ourselves for that as well. So um, this is just a little excerpt, but if there are any comments or questions on this, because it, I guess, can be quite a big topic. And again, you know, with these discussions, they don't have to remain intellectual or speculative. They can relate to your very life. Uh, maybe you have difficulties forgiving others or what do you do when someone doesn't acknowledge their mistake? What do we do then? AC, can we come to you? I'll try not to speak, say people's names actually, because what happens now is that, um, uh, the person asking the question's voice will be recorded, but not your video. So the video will always stay on me. But if you don't want your voice to be recorded, then you can write a question in the chat. Hi. Hi. Um, so good to see you back again. Um, I don't know about others, but it's a little hard to hear you. Can others hear you? Is it can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, so yes, it's great to have you back and thank you for sharing this, this piece of Dhamma. Uh, for me, it makes me think about, uh, for me, something that's more difficult even than forgiving others is forgiving myself for my own transgression. So I really like that in this, um, in this sutta, the, the Buddha uh, commends those who see their own transgressions as wise. I think that's helpful advice for forgiving oneself to say, to be able to say um, when we transgress, oh, look, I've transgressed and I can see it. And um, this is leading me on the path to wisdom. So I really like that about the sutta. Right, right. Yeah. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because it is often easier to forgive others than ourselves. But the Buddha here is saying that, you know, the other should forgive us. So if the other can forgive us and the other is who we've hurt, surely we can forgive us, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be different advice for ourselves. Um, and perhaps, you know, when we do just acknowledge our mistakes, it becomes easier to forgive in time because we realize we're not perfect and it, that's normal, right? I find for myself when I can talk about things, it kind of lifts off a lid of maybe shame or um, uh, even regret in a way because it takes a certain amount of acceptance to actually say, this is what I've done. Sometimes the pain is the bit where you like you wish you hadn't done it and you just can't quite bring yourself to say it. I mean, that happens sometimes, especially with monastics who maybe transgress fairly major rules. You know, I think sometimes it can take a while um, 
and some of the rules, depending on how long you've concealed it, the kind of time that you have to do a pen and say on quite a serious rule is longer. <laughs> um, so it encourages you to front up pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. Is there anyone else you'd like to add or raise anything else in relation to this first little bit? Mm -hmm. All good? Oh, Sean. Hello, Venerable. Lovely to uh, see you. Um, yeah, it was just, uh, just uh, you know, something I've um, been looking at the sitters of some of the old videos that I haven't, wasn't part of. And again, it just rings true here that there's absolutely no judgment in any of this. And also what Casey was saying about that, because it really starts with yourself. Um, you know, if you're really judgmental with other people, you're going to be being judgmental with yourself. So with this, it's like, it's just very accepting. Like you will make those mistakes. You will transgress. But, you know, that's just acknowledging it is the first step, right? That's what it feels like. Yes. Yes, absolutely. It's par for the course to make mistakes. And, and there is this beautiful system whereby you can confess um, to a trusted friend or to a teacher, you know, to anyone here, for example, in the community, if we feel we've done something that was less than ideal <laughs> and that may have hurt somebody. You know, sometimes even when you haven't, you, you might just want to ask, you know, did that come across a little bit harshly or, you know, have you any feedback for me? Um or we just pick things up from other people. I think you said that actually when you were with us, <laughs> staying at the Rihara, you were saying that you know your speech improved and your yeah. conduct improved just by virtue of being around other good people. You picked it up, you know. Um, it rubs off on us, doesn't it? Yeah. Which is really great. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. So uh, there's a question in the box for wise monastics that are on solitary retreat. What would they do if they find they've transgressed? <laughs> That's a nice question because you've actually said wise monastics. What would they do if they find they've transgressed? Yes, you can be wise and transgress. <laughs> it's a funny word, this transgress, isn't it? But we mean kind of breach some, well, basically done something that was harmful and that we know, you know, we could have done better at. It, it, we didn't really live up to our own um, ideal values in the way that we would have hoped so yeah on solitary retreat it's I feel very important to um to have guidance to have a teacher I mean this is the beauty of monastic life wherever you go even if you are in solitude there should be some kind of system around your support in fact there has to be because the Buddha told us not to live as hermits we was to live at, as arms mendicants who were dependent on the laity so most of the time, there will be other monastics around that you can go to. And it doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter if they're senior or junior. For example, when I was on retreat now for three months, um, yeah, myself and the other bhikkhuni, we didn't confess often because we had um, Ajahn Brahm as our teacher to go to. So we didn't do very many confessions together, but we did in the beginning and the end. Um, and we could do at any time if we'd have wished. Um, and it would almost be like a duty if one would ask the other, you know, may I uh, let you know something? And we always tried to be as revealing as possible. So every little thing, you know, like, for example, I got quite sick. And one day there was no electricity and I needed something for my stomach. Normally I'd heat something up, but there was no electricity. So I had to take something from the store in our own uh, accommodation, but it hadn't been formally offered. So, you know, I told her about that. And of course, it's understandable and whatever, and there's no judgment. But it's just nice to acknowledge that, OK, this, you know, isn't in line with the ideal. Um, and this was the circumstance that led to it. And then we can also look at ways to avoid those circumstances and situations in future. So yeah, um, basically I would always go to Ajahn Brahm, if anything, because I have that level of trust in him and uh, have done many times. And if he's not there, I send an email. Um, and I check things out with him all the time. You know, most of the time they're not even transgressions. I just check things out. I just let him know what I'm doing, basically. <laughs> um, 
And otherwise, yeah, you go to other monastics. If you are on solitary retreat and there really is no one around, either you might be able to phone someone or once it happened to Ajahn Brahm that he was in a very remote forest in the north of Thailand in a cave with a tea plantation. <laughs> so he got his uh, kombucha, his fermented tea to drink. And there really was no one. And he hadn't transgressed as such in speech or action, but he was having a lot of passionate, lustful thoughts, which actually didn't happen to him very much at all. But suddenly in one retreat, it happened big time. And uh, he got quite desperate. And so he went to the Buddha statue and paid respect to the Buddha and asked for help, asked for inspiration, for guidance. And he got an idea. I don't know how many of you know this story, but um, the idea was that he should do a deal with his mind. Because <laughs> Westerners, as he says, or those raised in kind of um, materialistic countries, uh, like to do deals. So what he did was say, okay, if uh, the mind can think whatever you want, but from three to four every afternoon, you have to focus on your breath. You're not allowed to think anything um, on monkish. <laughs> So he went back to meditate and lo and behold, the mind was even wilder than before. And then it got to three to 4 p.m. And he thought, oh, OK, now mind, do what you want. I give up and leant against the wall, said, right, just whatever you want to do, go for it. And lo and behold, his mind watched every single breath. <laughs> So that was his story of using some kind of intuitive wisdom to um, learn about the psychology of the mind. And it prevented a transgression, of course, um, which I'm sure wouldn't have happened anyway, because he just is a very, very diligent monk. But um, sometimes you're in a fix and it's difficult. So, yeah, make sure you have enough support. Make sure that you know what you're ready for. Because many people think, yeah, solitary retreat, this is what I want straight away, you know, and actually you haven't got the foundations of sila really, really strong. Sila means virtue for those who are not so accustomed to the Pali. And another question, how does one work with expectations around someone else seeing their transgressions as transgressions? Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess first of all, notice that it is an expectation right, that we expect others to, to know when they've done something wrong. And I think secondly, to really be patient, you know, and give that person time to realize it sometimes. Um, sometimes it's so easy to want to jump in, isn't it, and tell another person, you know, that um, what they've done has been hurtful or harmful in some way. But often it's more effective for that person to come to the realization themselves. I know for myself that I can be a little bit impatient generally with things, with my own progress, my own practice, my mind. So I try to pause and just say, okay, let that person come to it themselves. You know, sometimes at the monastery, one of the things I have to work with is um, I want everyone to be happy, obviously. <sighs> is it obvious? It's a bit silly you can't want that right and that's going to cause suffering but if someone is looking a little down or, or you know having a difficult time it's very easy for me to think what can I do should I say something is it me <laughs> and I'm trying to learn to just let that person feel what they feel give them space give them the time trust that they're old enough to work it out they can go to their room they can practice and quite often in the evening, they'll say, oh, I did have a difficult day. And I sort of, you know, and then I realized this or I realized that. And <laughs> I made peace with the emotion. And sometimes it's usually nothing to do with me. Right. So uh, I think that's one way. And then there's also some advice the Buddha gives about giving feedback to others, but it's so interesting because he gives so many caveats, you know, there's almost no situation in which you can actually give the advice because one of the first things is you have to be free from the same particular weakness yourself. So when you ask, okay, this person lied, right? You know, they lied. Why couldn't they kind of admit it? Do I ever lie? Hmm. Well, maybe I tell a white lie, you know, or maybe I don't quite reveal the whole truth. So how does it feel? 
And then when you see how it feels, perhaps you can develop compassion because you know it doesn't feel good, right? So I think having compassion for that person too is very helpful. Um, and then if you must give feedback, the kind of five uh, golden rules so that uh, it should be the right time. Yeah. I mean, we've done other classes on this, so I won't go into detail. You can think about that yourself. Um, it should be from the mind of metta, not of ill will. So go meditate first, <laughs> blow off some steam, let it out, calm down. It should be gentle, very gentle. It should be true and it should be beneficial. Yeah. That's good. And there's lots of other sort of advisors in this, in this book actually about right speech. You might want to uh, get hold of this and have a look in that chapter. But yeah, I think um, Ajahn Chah said, you know, I only worry about other people 5% of the time. At the most, <laughs> and think of yourself. Think about your own conduct for the rest of it. So, yeah, it does go into more detail though in this in this chapter. Okay, so shall we continue? It's amazing what we can squeeze out of a little bit of uh, of text. Yeah, All right. I'll continue the next bit, and this is quite a longer passage. At least three pages long from Majjhima Nikaya number 103. And this is called Resolving Differences in Opinion. <laughs> I think uh, most of us will have experienced having differences in opinion because opinions we hold, tend to hold to pretty strongly, right? Our opinion is almost who we are quite often. It's like you come to that through years and years of reflection and experience and using your mind and must be right. So what do we do when someone else has a different? So again, this is in the context of a monastery, but please don't um, feel that that excludes you at all because we all live in community to some degree, whether it's our families, whether it's our workplace, colleagues, spiritual communities, etc. So same principles apply. Resolving differences in opinion. While you are training in concord with mutual appreciation, without disputing, two monastics or two people might make different assertions concerning the Dhamma. <laughs> I'm relieved to hear this because it really is true that it, it quite often happens. <laughs> and they're both good, good monastics, good bhikkhunis, good bhikkhus. Now, if you should think thus, these venerable ones differ about both the meaning and the phrasing, then whichever monastic you think is more reasonable should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable ones differ about both the meaning and the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason that there is a difference about the meaning and a difference about the phrasing. Let them not fall into a dispute. Then, whichever monastic you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the opposite part should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable ones differ about the meaning and the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it's for this reason that there's a difference about the meaning and a difference about the phrasing. Let them not fall into a dispute. So what has been wrongly grasped should be borne in mind as wrongly grasped. Bearing in mind what has been wrongly grasped as wrongly grasped, what is the Dhamma and what is the discipline should be expounded. So that's quite interesting. A little bit cryptic, maybe? Seems a little bit cryptic to me. Um, <laughs> but I think the basic meaning here is that we first acknowledge it and we can question monastics, right? We, we don't have to just accept whatever they say. If you see that there's a difference between two monastics, then bring it up and bring it up politely and just pointing out that there seems to be a difference to somebody who you trust, to whichever monastic you trust. So when it says uh, you should know that it's for this reason there's a difference about the meaning and a difference about the phrasing, I guess the, the differences will change, the meaning rather will, uh, will change. There'll be different reasons. Um, 
that there are differences between two people. And often those different reasons I've noticed are just who you happen to be around. I mean, if you happen to be around teachers who use a certain type of language, then you'll pick up the same language. If you happen to be around a different community on the other side of the world, you might describe things using different words, different phrases, right? And sometimes there may be a different meaning, but sometimes it might be just different words that we use for something quite similar. So I think that's important to understand too, you know, there might maybe not be as much difference as you think, but we need to understand the teaching in context, yeah? And also understand if something's been wrongly grasped and then teach what the Dhamma is, what the discipline is, and how do we know? I mean, the main way that we can know is actually to check out our understanding in line with the suttas. And I think this is where people go wrong, you know, when we're practicing on our own, maybe in the forest, maybe there's not a lot of respect for the suttas or not a lot of access maybe to the suttas um, or encouragement to read them. And then you start using certain words to describe certain experiences, which may be not that precise. And what you mean by it might be different from what someone else understands by it, right? Um, I mean, there are so many different states of mind that we can experience in meditation. And if we don't have the whole map, we may easily mistake one thing for something that it's not. Um, and the Buddha always says, you know, you should check it out against the suttas, against his teachings. And if your experience is in line with what the Buddha says, then perhaps, you know, perhaps it is um, close to the insights that the Buddha had, or, or maybe it is, you know, a deep meditation experience similar to what the Buddha described. But even then, you can't be so sure for a long time because you do have to examine yourself and have a look at um, which, uh, what can we call them? I really don't like this word defilements, but other words sound a bit funny. <laughs> so let's just say, you know, hindrances, okay. Which ones have been overcome? Which ones have been weakened? And which ones still remain? So we don't get so fixated on where we think we are. And again, you know, always go back to what is the Dhamma, what is the discipline? So the essentials of the teachings, right? Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Noble Paths, uh, there has to be sila, virtue. If someone's saying, oh, that's kind of optional, you can just sit down on a cushion and get into deep states of mind and thereby become liberated. Even if you do uh, transgress, then this is not the Dhamma that the Buddha taught. Yeah. If you want to actually experience uh, the enlightenment that the Buddha experienced, then you have to actually follow the practices that he, he did. Right. Other practices may get you somewhere, but it won't be the same place. And there's a danger of getting lost. So I think this is really nice, actually, in that, you know, it's it's monastics here. And monastics also have a duty to um, take feedback. In this case, it seems to me that they're taking it from from lay people, perhaps, or perhaps from other monastics as well. And we have that duty. And I think a good teacher won't get offended if you question them on their understanding or on a meaning, you know, on the, how they describe the Dhamma. Yeah. Recently, um, I spoke with another bhikkhuni about something another senior monk had said and uh, asked what he meant by that or asked her to figure out what he, ask him what he meant by that. And she said, well, um, that person said that if you have to ask, you haven't understood. And I was a bit disappointed by that because I thought, well, surely you should be able to explain what you mean by what you say. Um, of course, we haven't understood. That's why we ask, isn't it? <laughs> if we'd understood, we wouldn't have to ask. So I think it's really important to be open to scrutiny and open to questions. To try and explain yourself clearly, um, if possible, using similar terms that the Buddha used so that we're on the same page. Um, well, I've said quite a lot about that already, and I can see there's some more comments in the chat, so I'll, I'll bring those in now and uh, then invite questions from everyone else. Uh, so I think this comment is probably pertaining to the last uh, 
part of the reading. I had someone steal from my son. We caught the boy who did it. We went to get my son's property back with the police. The parents were intoxicated at four in the afternoon. I lost my temper. Talk about ego. I was appalled by the boy stealing and the condition of the parents. I said a lot to the boys and the parents that I now regret. Yeah, I mean, it's understandable that you would lose your temper. <laughs> and at least now you've realized that it wasn't skillful, right? And you can acknowledge that. So, I mean, it's wonderful that you, you share that with everybody here, which is exactly what we've just been saying, isn't it? That's what the Buddha advised. And I'm sure that people here appreciate that openness and, um, and would forgive you if it were our place to forgive. The question is perhaps, you know, how you will forgive yourself and whether you can. Um, understanding that, you know, obviously you would have felt upset. It's quite natural, isn't it, to feel upset if somebody steals, a young person steals, because you would hope that they would get a, a better education, they would be taught some ethics by their parents, but at the same time, the parents obviously aren't coping too well and probably not setting a very good example for the boy. So it's sad. And uh, again, perhaps when we reflect in a different way, compassion can arise. So... And we can really remember these experiences and uh, reflect on them so that next time something happens, we can see the same pattern, you know, if somebody else uh, does something that harms your boy or harms a family member in particular, that's when we get most triggered, isn't it? Um, you can consider that maybe they're hurting. Maybe they have circumstances we can't even imagine. Uh, I mean, why are his parents intoxicated at four in the afternoon? do all kinds of things so much of addiction is actually trauma it's caused by trauma and how many people must have unresolved trauma in their lives yeah sometimes there's a possibility to apologize but if you can't meet those people you can at least send them messages Okay, another comment. I find it interesting here that the Buddha doesn't give any advice about trying to resolve the wrong grasping of the meaning on either side, but instead prioritizes giving up the dispute. I wonder if part of the reason for this is because someone practicing well will slowly start to find the right meaning on their own. Yeah, that is interesting, isn't it? He's not trying to resolve it, but he is sort of saying, go to the one you think is most reasonable. So maybe he is encouraging you to find out more and to, you know, see if those people can explain where they're coming from, um, but really leaving it up to you to decide. But I think to me, the advice basically is to put down what has been wrongly grasped. So again, it depends on recognizing it and then to teach what is the Dhamma and the discipline. So it's coming back to the Buddha's words. So, yeah, I mean, that is the best way to resolve these things. You know, if somebody says to me, well, you know, everything's impermanent, but actually consciousness is permanent, then I'll be like, hmm, doesn't sound quite right. So let me go to the Nidana Samyutta, <laughs> just a hint, uh, <laughs> where the Buddha talks about conditionality, causality, and, and read what he says about that. And when you read that and you find that actually that, you know, doesn't really ring true with the Dharma, with, with the teaching of the Buddha, then you don't need to dispute with the person who said it. You don't need to dispute it. They might have other good things that they do teach. It's maybe just an indication of how far their understanding, their insight into impermanence has gone, you know, because none of us have the full penetration of impermanence, suffering, and non-self at this stage. If we did, we'd be arahats. I don't think any of you are arahats. I mean, I'm guessing. Or you'd probably be in robes. I'm in robes, but I'm not an arahat. <laughs> Hands up. So, you know, I can find myself getting a little bit, you know, um, up my, what do you call it? High, high horse, on my high horse, is that right? 
on my high horse because I know that you know what I said all conditioned phenomena and that basically means everything that we can see everything that exists supposedly is uh impermanent suffering in oneself so for me it's a red flag when someone says otherwise but instead of criticizing the person I can just go to the suttas and teach um what the dhamma that the buddha gave the dhamma that the buddha expanded right to the best of my ability so Ajahn Brahm always says that he says don't criticize people just and don't even criticize wrong view just teach right view actually we do criticize wrong view I mean <laughs> but probably just more to each other than to the people involved because it, it just gets people's backs up doesn't it people aren't ready to hear what they're saying really Good. Any more comments on this? Or should we read the next bit? It follows a similar pattern. And it may open all of this out. So now, if you should think thus, these venerable ones differ about the meaning, but agree about the phrasing. Then whichever monastic you think is more reasonable should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable ones differ about the meaning, but agree about the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason that there is a difference about the meaning, but agreement about the phrasing. Let them not fall into a dispute. So in a way, it's asking us to understand where the other's coming from, isn't it? Then, whichever monastic you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the opposite part should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable ones differ about the meaning, but agree about the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it is for this reason that there's a difference about the meaning, but agreement about the phrasing. Let them not fall into a dispute. So what has been wrongly grasped should be borne in mind as wrongly grasped, and what has been rightly grasped should be borne in mind as rightly grasped. So it's almost like just putting down whatever's confusing and whatever leads to disputes. Because I think, again, the Buddha's just really showing the importance of harmony almost above everything. But we can still, you know, even when there are differences of opinion, we can still um, learn something from that person. There'll be something of value. Bearing in mind what has been wrongly grasped as wrongly grasped and bearing in mind what has been rightly grasped as rightly grasped, what is the Dhamma and what is the discipline should be expounded. So again, no judgment. Now, if you think thus, these venerable ones agree about the meaning, but differ about the phrasing, then whichever monastic you think is more reasonable should be approached and addressed thus. The venerable ones agree about the meaning, but differ about the phrasing. The venerable one should know that it is for this reason that there's agreement about the meaning, but difference about the phrasing. But the phrasing is a mere trifle. Let the venerable ones not fall into dispute over a mere trifle. That doesn't mean a dessert. But that's quite interesting because, <laughs> sorry, it's, it's actually the wrong time for monastics to talk about dessert especially in front of my guests who are probably starving. Anyway, they're on eight precincts. Um, this is interesting because it doesn't say that in the others because they actually differed about the meaning in the others. That's a little bit more um, potentially difficult. But here it's the phrasing and the Buddha is saying it's a mere trifle. And I find that really interesting because I often wonder in some cases whether it is just different words we use to describe similar things. Yeah. Still, I think we have to analyze that and ask exactly what do you mean by that word? Um, but sometimes it might be just a way of speaking that we pick up from the people we're around. So whichever monk you think or monastic you think is the most reasonable of those who side together on the opposite part should be approached and addressed thus. Venerable ones agree about the meaning but differ about the phrasing. The venerable ones should know that it's for this reason that there's agreement about the meaning and difference about the phrasing. But the phrasing is a mere trifle. 
Let the venerable ones not fall into a dispute over a mere trifle. So what has been rightly grasped should be borne in mind as rightly grasped, and what has been wrongly grasped should be borne in mind as wrongly grasped. Bearing in mind what has been rightly grasped as rightly grasped, and bearing in mind what's been wrongly grasped as wrongly grasped, what is the Dhamma and what is the discipline should be expounded. Okay, I think I'm going to skip a bit at this point. I'll just go to the box. Uh, so is it because they're still grasping to self, to their own views? <laughs> yeah, most probably, right? Yeah. Wrongly grasped, rightly grasped. We just teach what is the demo and the discipline. Yeah. Much of the time we add a lot to the Dhamma and the discipline. We had a lot of our views to it. Um, and people who have seen non-self, they tend to teach the Dhamma. And even if someone disagrees, there's no charge in it for them. You know, they just continue to teach the Dhamma. Um, it doesn't sway them either because they, they understand through their own experience um, the Buddha's teachings. So I think that's a good point. Grasping to self, grasping to views, probably wrong views, right? By saying it's a mere trifle, it seems to point towards letting go. Absolutely. It's a lovely sentence to read, actually. Let them not fall into dispute over a mere trifle. Maybe you can fall into dispute over like steam, treacle, sponge, but not trifle, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's very nice. It puts things into perspective, you know. Why why argue and fight over such small things? I mean, there are people in this world involved in terrible disputes and killing each other over much worse things, huge things, right? I mean, actually, maybe not, but <laughs> maybe they're also quite trifling. But um, I don't know. For me, it's... Getting involved in too many academic disputes and kind of getting sidetracked in that way does tend to imply that we've lost touch with the real problem of suffering. Because it's not about being right or wrong, you know, it's about teaching Dhamma to help alleviate suffering. You know? And if something works, wonderful. Okay. So there is more. And most of them go through the same uh, the same kind of pattern. The next one is interesting. I won't read the whole thing, but it's basically where both parties agree about the meaning and the phrasing. And still, they have to not fall into a dispute. So that's interesting. <laughs> Maybe we can fall into disputes even when we agree. I don't know. That's a bit uh, surprising. <laughs> But still, even if you both agree, we have to teach the Dhamma and the discipline. So again, the Buddha's saying, you know, don't just go on what you think. Just because somebody else agrees with you, don't sort of grasp that either. Just keep coming back to the Buddha's teachings. Then he says, further, while you're training in concord with mutual appreciation, without disputing, some monastic might commit an offence or transgression. Now, here's the answer, actually, to someone's question from before. Now, monastics, you should not hurry to reprove them. So again, the patience. Rather, the person should be examined thus. I shall not be troubled, and the other person will not be hurt. For the other person is not given to anger and resentment. They are not firmly attached to their view and they relinquish it easily. And I can make that person emerge from the whole unwholesome and establish them in the wholesome. If such occurs to you, monastics, it's proper to speak. Yeah? So it's not just about waiting for them to see their own transgression here. You're actually pausing and not hurrying up to reprove them. But first, you're checking out whether it's going to have any benefit for that person if you do. Right? So you examine that person. 
whether or not they're given to anger and resentment, whether or not they're firmly attached to their view and relinquish it easily, and whether you can make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish them in the wholesome, right? Because that's your aim. That's the only reason really for us to try to give um, feedback if we think it's gonna have some beneficial effect, yeah? first part as well is that I shall not be troubled and the other will not be hurt. So again, the Buddha's concern for both parties, right? Sometimes maybe the other person won't be hurt, but it will be very, very troubling to you and you'll be exhausted and run out of steam and it's just not worth it. So let's have a look because there's different combinations here. <coughs> that will make the priorities clearer. Then it may occur to you monastics, I shall not be troubled, but the other person will be hurt, for the other person is given to anger and resentment. However, they are not firmly attached to their view and they relinquish it easily. And I can make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish them in the wholesome. It is mere trifle that the other person will be hurt, but it's a much greater thing that I can make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish them in the wholesome. If such occurs to you, monastics, it's proper to speak. Hmm. So this is, you know, this is much more subtle and much more risky, isn't it? Because we have to sort of measure whether the hurt that they experience is worth it somehow for the sake of establishing them in the wholesome. So sometimes maybe it's a temporary amount of hurt for avoiding greater hurt in the long run by continuing to do unwholesome things. But I mean, I just say really that this takes a lot of discernment because the last thing we do want to do is hurt people unless we're sure it's gonna really be for their benefit longer term. And I think most of the time we rush too much. And the motivation is very beautiful, isn't it? To establish a person in the wholesome. I think this really relates to teachers, doesn't it? People in the position of teachers who have the, that wisdom to do it. And very few still, I think, would do it. Sometimes, actually, the way um, teachers do it, the way Ajahn Brahm does it in his monastery is um, not to hurt anybody by actually... Uh, admonishing them personally but to just hint or talk about general ways of behavior in the Dhamma talks so it becomes very impersonal and the person who's done something will probably know that it relates to them but they won't be exposed because it's likely there'll be 10 other people in the room that it could relate to as well right and it's very obvious in the Dhamma talk that Ajahn Brahm is trying to encourage the wholesome states you know that because the teacher's full of compassion. So I think this is also a prerequisite for this kind of um, um, this kind of uh, what can we call it teaching that a person may give. You know, it's better if they are coming from a place of deep compassion. You have to be very sure of your intention. So I'll go through the others, and then hopefully we'll still have time for some um, questions. So then it may occur to you, I shall be troubled, but the other person will not be hurt, for the other person is not given to anger and resentment, although they are firmly attached to their view and relinquish it with difficulty. Yet I can make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish them in the wholesome. It's a mere trifle that I shall be troubled, but it's a much greater thing that I can make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish him in the unwholesome or her. If such occurs to you, it is proper to speak. So just as it's a trifle if they're hurt, if it's for the greater good, it's a trifle if they're troubled as well. Then it may occur to you, monastics, I shall be troubled and the other person will be hurt, for the other person is given to anger and resentment and are firmly attached to their view and relinquish it with difficulty. Yet I can make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish them in the wholesome. 
It's a mere trifle that I shall be troubled and the other person hurt. But it's a much greater thing that I can make that person emerge from the unwholesome and establish them in the wholesome. If such occurs to you, monastics, it is proper to speak. So this is making me think that it would be a trifle in the case that you would really prevent someone doing major harm, wouldn't it? It'd be worth it if you were stopping someone, for example, from killing or from stealing, raping. So maybe we have to measure this by just how much unwholesomeness can be avoided. Yeah. And how um, heinous an act that person may otherwise do. Then it may occur to you, monastics, I should be troubled and the other person will be hurt, for the other person is given to anger and resentment and is firmly attached to their view and relinquish it with difficulty. And I cannot make them emerge from the unwholesome and establish them in the wholesome. So this is the one where it's hopeless. So what do we do? One should not underrate equanimity toward such a person. No. And I think that applies for me anyway, with things like, you know, seeing really corrupt politicians on television, or, <laughs> you know, people that I can't have any influence on. It's better not to allow my mind to become unwholesome and myself to be troubled by what they're up to. It's enough just to know what they stand for and not vote, <laughs> right? And not encourage others to vote for them. But um, not that monastics should do that. Um, it's much better if I can remain economist. And sometimes that involves turning away a little bit, you know, not kind of flooding your mind with thoughts of that person or um, with constant sources of miserable news. I'm going to just come to the chat because someone's had a question there for a while and then I'll come to Kilea. Kilea, is that right? All right. Is it right then if another is holding strongly onto their view to simply stay, style, stay silent and maintain our peace? Yeah, so sometimes it might be, right? But I think in this case, the Buddha is giving lots and lots of different scenarios so that we can understand where that would be the right thing to do and where it might be better to try and um, establish them in a better view, perhaps. So, yeah, there's some cases here where they are holding on strongly to their view and relinquishing them with difficulty, but still it's worth trying to point it out if we feel fairly sure that we can help them to think in ways that are going to lead to wholesome states arising. Yeah, But you have to be careful because most of the time people really rile against it, especially if they feel you're coming with some ego or something to prove. Um, again, I think we can teach a lot by how we behave, you know, and we can even address it in a more passive way. Sometimes we can just state the way we think about things, you know, maybe we just talk about the virtues of being harmless or, um, you know, how it feels to be kind. You don't have to actually talk about the flaws in their view on something. You can more embody your own views that have helped you and maybe make that connection between the way you think and the way you behave. You know, for example, today I went to see Venerable Dhammasami. I was so fortunate for anyone who knows him. He's, um, he used to be known as Oxford Sayadaw. I guess he still is, but he was in Myanmar now for about four years. He was sort of stuck there during the corona pandemic and hasn't come back for a long time. He's got a university there. And he was saying, you know, that actually suffering is the right motivation it's a wonderful motivation for this path for undertaking this path because it can lead to compassion you know it becomes worthwhile in a sense it becomes a uh, fertilizer for the path <laughs> when we can relate to it with compassion so having right view that there is suffering, that beings suffer. Not necessarily, obviously, desiring to suffer. We don't want to inflict that on anyone or say, well, that's good for them. You know, that's not compassionate at all. But the fact that there is going to be suffering in our lives and the lives of others, but that that can have um, some purpose to help us um, 
live a life that hopefully will alleviate some of that and, and see that that's our motivation for practice rather than just peaceful states for our own enjoyment. That's all well and good, but it needs to expand beyond um, our own well-being to really start addressing some of the suffering in the world. Um, okay, we'll come to you now, the person with their hand up, and uh, ask you to unmute. Would you like to speak? Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Bonte. Thank you for the teachings. Um, I really liked what you just read there, and I was wondering if you think this use of the word equanimity in this occasion adds something to what I normally hear to the practice of equanimity in terms of the Brahma Viharas. It seems like in this case, equanimity is being used in a very active sense, like as a way to address a social evil or a social injustice, mm -hmm. um, which seems to, to me to, to put it in a tool set along with love and kindness and mm -hmm. compassion uh, uh, and um, empathetic joy. But I don't hear that spoken of very much. I was wondering what your thoughts on that are. In other mm -hmm. words, actively using equanimity towards evil that we see in the world as a way to properly address that evil, you know, mm -hmm. is a powerful way to. Right, right. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I wonder, um, just hearing you speak, I think you're right. It's not the Brahma Vihara of equanimity as in a, a deep state of samadhi at this point. It's more of a... Um, a skillful means, a way of relating to the situation that perhaps gives our mind some rest. And maybe that's where it can be very helpful. For example, in activism, you know, whatever it is, whether it's trying to start the Bikuni Sangha in the UK, that's definitely a kind of activism, or whether it's, you know, Extinction Rebellion or um, fighting for, you know, rights of the LGBTQIA plus community, whatever it is, being an ally to, to black folks and people of color, um, it can be very tiring, it can be very draining, and also, you know, there can be a lot of despair and despondency arising, and sometimes, you know, we just need to rest, so I think sometimes, again, it's good to put the brakes on, just stop for a while, and realize that this moment, that doesn't seem to be um, a skillful way to proceed, maybe I just remain calm, you know, even-minded, try and gain some perspective on the situation so that later on, when there is an opening, I can see how to proceed. I can see what to do. Because sometimes we're just we're in such a rush, aren't we? <laughs> and because of that, we make mistakes. You know, we don't assess the situation properly. I mean, here we've assessed it and we've seen that we can't really make that person emerge at this time from unwholesome to establish them in the wholesome. So I think at this time is an important caveat there. Um, it's not that you maybe remain equanimous for your whole life, um, but certainly I think it's important generally to realize that despite all our best intentions, despite you know however much compassion and metta and mudita we can generate towards those suffering and those having a you know enjoying happiness, um, still beings are subject to their own karma and they're going to suffer accordingly. So we can only do our bit, and then we have to leave the results um, to nature to some extent. So that's also where equanimity comes in. There's another place in um, overcoming resentment. I think that's in this book under the chapter on anger, most probably. And equanimity is used there as well as a way to um, overcome resentment to a person that, uh, yeah, you just, you've tried the other methods with. You've tried to have compassion, equanimity, etc. But this person is just too, um, their behavior may be too depraved. You know, they may, you may find it just too difficult to see any good redeeming qualities in them. And in that case, we, it's better to practice equanimity. And sometimes that means staying at a distance from the person, you know, maybe not associating with them even at all. I mean, you can understand that if, say, somebody has violated you in some way, you're not going to kind of want to see them probably. Um, so the, the next one the Buddha talks about is even ignoring the person. But it doesn't mean, I, I always feel it's like a means to 
allow you the space to overcome your resentment in the longer term. Yeah, so it's like a pause. It's like getting enough distance so that you can, you feel safe, you can rest, you can pause, and then you can come from a place of loving kindness. And when the time is right, um, act in a skillful way. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, you want to unmute? Hang on. Ah, thank you. Uh, that's very helpful. Thank you. I was, I was also thinking about whether the passage could be implying that there's some power, like even you know, I mean, as even a prayer. I would say prayer, but that's kind of using that kind of as an analogy. Like we're we're facing someone who's not going to change, say, and has views, wrong views. And our equanimity has some power to actually mm. lead them to the proper dhamma, which yeah. is, is somewhat, you know, is a is magical to me in a way. In other words, we're doing the right thing, but we're also have we're also active yeah. in using this equanimity. Uh, that's that's a, a, that seems to be a potential way to read that. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful, actually. That's beautiful. Thank you for saying that. Because so often, you know, we're doers, aren't we? Compulsive doers. And we think we have to kind of be expressing something in order to have an influence. But sometimes actually just standing back and remaining calm is a teaching in and of itself. Definitely. I mean, I can see that in my own family, you know, or you can see that in any situation where you might be triggered, right? from time to time and if you can just keep your calm and equipoise people will kind of it will de-escalate the situation and and people may start to think hmm you know this person seems to have something that perhaps I don't have and, and it's certainly you're not contributing to the conflict and that will uh, I mean this is I guess one of the reasons that I do think um, even being on retreat has some kind of power you know even when we're not active and I do think it's important to serve and be engaged to some extent, greater or lesser, according to your inclination, with the problems in the world. But there are times for just pulling back and retreating. And um, I do believe that gives an energy and a power, a very healing power in the world. And thanks for that. That's a beautiful reflection. So I'll come to the box and then I think we're more or less out of time for today uh try and remember where we left off most of the way through that little passage so i'll just come to the box for the last comment uh yeah i think that i'll just read the previous one again because that really relates to it um so is it right if another is holding strongly onto their view to simply say silent and maintain our peace so in the light of what we were just saying, I think that's definitely a powerful way. But again, you know, there's no um, one way that's right in every situation. So just experiment, see what happens and learn. So lastly, when practicing equanimity, remind yourself of the laws of karma. Exactly. That the person who misbehaves has to bear the consequences of their actions. That's right, yeah. We're definitely not, shouldn't be the agent of those consequences uh, for another person if they're negative consequences. Um, and of course, we do our best to bring that person out of um, wrong view or any action that may cause harm to themselves and others. But ultimately, we can't control others. <laughs> we often can't even control or, or tame ourselves, right? We know, we think we know what the right or the wrong thing to do is, but time and again, we'll act in unskillful ways. Um, and we suffer from that, you know, more than anyone else. We suffer from that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's important to remind yourself of that. And I think when equanimity does arise, um, it's not cold, it's not indifferent. You know, we understand that they have to bear the consequences of their actions, but it's not with glee, <laughs> you know. It's um, it's just a sobering lesson that can perhaps help us also to, um, to take more care 
in our um, attitudes, our behaviors, our speech. So the laws are the same for all of us. And, uh, and we're all learning and that's okay. We're going to make mistakes, but imagine if we hadn't got the Dhamma, you know, how many mistakes we'd be making and not even know it. So I always feel that everything is a progress. And as the Buddha says here, and as we began the class with, you know, to see one's transgression as a transgression is already progress. And to forgive that transgression, whether it's of someone else or of ourselves, is a progress as well. And that will help you become wise. So... May you all learn to uh, forgive yourselves, to be honest with yourselves, and to see um, where you can uh, develop your minds in beautiful ways that lead to your own benefit and the benefit of all those who come across you and maybe even those who are far away. Um, yeah, and sometimes the best thing to do is to just stay calm and to wait and uh, practice equanimity. So... I think that's all for today. Um, I am going to invite Shell now to come and say a few words to close the session. She's just going to like replace me, so my face is going to suddenly change, and uh, and then I, I guess I'll come back again. Maybe you can just hush. Yeah, I'll just hush up a bit, um, and then I'll come back and tell you what's up next. everyone so thank you everyone for joining us this evening and a huge thank you to venerable chanda um for sharing her wisdom and the dharma with us it's such a joy to have you back um so uh every talk and everything that um venerable chanda does for annie camper is in the spirit of dana generosity and so we're kindly asking for your generosity to support the monastic Sangha of Anukampa and the daily running of the Vihara. Um, so in particular, we are asking if you are able to support financially, we're looking for uh, some donations of supermarket gift cards. And there's some more information on the website. There's eight ways uh, to donate towards the Sangha here and the Vihara. Um, but there's plenty of other ways as well for you to get involved including giving uh, monthly donations. So perhaps even just the price of coffee, um, three pound a month, if everyone did that in our Sangha, it would be amazing. We'd be on our way to getting a bigger place. And ultimately we are looking to expand both the Sangha, the monastic community, um, and the options for the lay community to progress towards monastic Sangha. And to do that, we need your support um, in building this lovely Bahara perhaps one day soon, into an even bigger abode to house more of the monastic community and lay community that's supporting the Sangha. Um, there's also opportunities to come and join Venerable Chanda um, and hopefully other bhikkhunis in the future here to support them in the running of the Vihara. So if you can donate your time here, please drop an email to team at anukampaproject.org and Minori has kindly put those links in the chat as well. I'm going to hand back to Venerable Chanda. It's been a pleasure to see everyone. Thank you, Sadi Sadi Sadi. <laughs> ah, wonderful. Thanks to Shell. And uh, yeah, so the next uh, program for us, for anyone who is on in this part of the world, is uh, Ajahn Brahm's tour. So my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, will be coming to England in just a few days. And he doesn't get five days to sleep like me. He just gets straight into the talks. And uh, yeah, I think the retreats that we're having are full. Um, there is one talk that's happening via Zoom as well. So for those in uh, any time zone that's uh, at all compatible, there'll be a talk on Tuesday the 14th at I think 7 p.m. UK time via Zoom. Uh, you can find that on our website, anucumperproject.org slash events um and uh what else we are going to live stream some of these retreats um at least the first talk isn't it matthias is going to be helping with that he's our ace uh i don't know what we can call you just brilliant dhamma server really in spreading the dhamma uh so that means on the 9th 10th and 11th of november on the 
18th and 19th of November uh, at about 9, 9.30 in the morning. There should be some live streaming on Facebook, I think. No, YouTube? YouTube channel, our YouTube channel, Anukampa Bikuni Project. So you can follow along. We won't be able to take questions, I'm afraid, because the retreats are really full and we're going to really struggle to take even a fraction of the questions that people want to ask. So, but you can follow and everything will be recorded anyway and uh, offered um, freely on our on our Anukampa Bikini Project YouTube channel. Um, what else? There's a new year retreat with me in Sheffield. I guess some of that might also be live streamed or zoomed or something, but everything will go up anyway online. Um, what else? Well, I'm doing a retreat in Norway next year <laughs> in April 20 to the 28th. Uh, what else? I'm doing a retreat in America. Actually, bookings out tomorrow. Bookings open tomorrow for that. That's in Washington State or, yeah, Cloud Mountain Retreat Center. It's going to be a meta retreat, so a deep immersion into loving kindness. It's about six days long, I think. Uh, retreat center called Cloud Mountain. It's on the same events page, I think. It's under special events. What else am I doing? Stuff at Gaia House. Anyway, there's loads of stuff and there's other teachers too and who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> but for anyone here at all, including the guys, if you can ever come to Oxford, you're very warmly welcome to stay with us. We only probably have a sofa bed in the shrine room at the moment for the men staying here but it's it's quite comfy and it's a small place so uh it's a simple routine bit of community work in the morning and lots of time to practice in the afternoon but we try and fill it up with meta uh as well as silence so i think that's all thank you for asking me to sleep well i didn't sleep well last night at all <laughs> i had really crazy dreams but i didn't sleep much so um, I am hoping to recover from jet lag soon. Take care. Oh, tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> Nine o'clock UK time meta meditation. And uh, the next sort of classes and meta sessions are on our website as well. So take care. All the very best to you all. May you be happy, may you be well. Take care and live at ease. So...